Today we're talking about navigating internships and early career steps, and we are joined by Michael Ehrman of Amber Book and Virginia Tech. And Michael, welcome to the podcast. Great to have you here. Thank you very much. Yeah, you've been on other podcasts of mine, but this is the first time of Arca Speak, and I know you've been listening for a while. So long time listener, nice first uh, first time caller. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you give a little bit of background so that everybody can learn a little bit more about who you are? Sure, I'm in my 23rd year teaching architecture at Virginia Tech. I teach design studio. I teach uh, uh, building systems. I sometimes teach materials and methods of construction. Um, I occasionally teach a graduate class on architectural acoustics as well. And I've taught, I taught structures. I've taught, I taught a class called design at every scale, a walking tour, where I just kind of took nine majors around, around campus and town. And we just started talking about urban design, everything down to the like microscope, microscopes and that kind of thing. It was really fun. <laughs> Anyhow. And I also created a course for architects who are seeking licensure called Amber book. Nice. How long have you been licensed? Ironically, given some of the things we're going to talk about today, I was a late to licensure person. I've been licensed something on the order of seven years, but I was 43 when I, when I finally got licensed. All right. I think you're in good Sounds company. Interestingly <laughs> familiar. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember, Cormac, I do remember you talking about licensure with the other two back then. I yeah. think you had a third host and, and I remember kind of shouting at the, I remember kind of shouting at my headphones, like, get the Amber book. We'll help you out. Get the Amber book. <laughs> <laughs> and and we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit more, but it, it was sort of this weird embarrassment to even admit that I wasn't licensed mm -hmm. so late into my career where we have so many people looking to me to guide them, mentor them and everything else. Yet I wasn't licensed. Yeah. Being an architect and calling yourself an architect and, and just the, the, the weirdness around all of that, I think makes yeah that feel like it felt like for you, right? Because it's, oh, yeah, you were yeah. totally an architect. <laughs> you just couldn't oh, call yourself well, and that's an the, architect. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, uh, yeah. when, when people ask, well, what's the advantage of licensure? I'd say, you kind of be surprised. Most of it is just being able to call yourself an architect. Like that's the, right. from yeah. the point of view of the individual, it's just really frustrating to have to kind of decide whether or not you're going to risk censure <laughs> by saying I'm an yeah. architect True. or yeah. talk about yourself as a designer too, or something like that and have people kind of scratch their head and not, not really sure what that means. Or, or, or say, <laughs> well, I'm a project manager at an architecture firm. And they're like, well, what does that mean? It's just like, <laughs> it means that I do a lot of stuff that architects do that I can't call myself an architect. Uh, I'm, I'm often surprised. I mean, people would be, I'm not surprised, but people would be surprised by the number of people at every kind of the, the long tail of age of the age of people who are studying for licensure, people in yeah. their 60s and even 70s. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's, that's incredible. Well, since we're talking about internship programs today, I mean, maybe we'll just kick off a little bit about our first internship experiences versus maybe what we see as an idealized internship experience. And I think part of this is to give candidates and graduates or people who are in school an idea of what to look for in internship programs, but also to give firms ideas about how they can improve their internship programs strategically, proactively. So that that's kind of where I'm really passionate about this. And I, we'll, we'll weave all this together, I think. But but Michael, do you want to, did you intern when you were in school for architecture? Tell us about that. I did. The first the first such job, I had some great job. I'm one of those people who kind of loves work. So every job <laughs> I've ever had, I've loved. Just with one notable construction exception. Um, but, um, but, uh, but, um, uh, that's the, the first, story the, I want to hear. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just start with that one. I, I worked, I worked on a crew that was exceptionally cruel <laughs> and I was 15. I couldn't drive yet. So I had to kind of rely on them to pick me up and they, they were just drunk the whole time. And, oh, wow. And they would, you know, and they'd be, they kind of knew I was probably going to college and they'd kind of swing hammers at me and come too close on purpose and wait for me to stand up for myself. And I was completely wow. intimidated. I frankly wasn't that used to being picked on. And, and I was like, oh, this sucks. Like, this is no <laughs> fun at all. Yeah. And so that, that was, and that actually years later, I ran into the guy who owned the construction company and he said, when did you work there? And I told him what year and he said, oh, that was the worst. That was the worst group of people. <laughs> like, <laughs> we could not get anybody. We were going to the bottom of the barrel. For, I mean, they just reeked of alcohol. But anyhow, oh, the, the, wow. the first the first project I had, I just got my driver's license and the, and I went to, I went to, I grew up in Delaware. And so I went to Wilmington, Delaware and I just went through the phone book and I just rolled into each firm alphabetically or not, maybe not alphabetically. I probably 
cordoned off by region of the city, but I went to each firm and just rolled in there unannounced with my roll of drawings and my model from high school. And the first two days got nothing all day and got nothing. And the third day, the third day I got two job offers. And one of them was a design build landscape architecture firm. It was the coolest job. We would be in the office two or three days a week drawing up plans and we'd be in the field two or three days a week digging in the ground and and for a for a 16 or 17 year old that was just the most remarkable yeah. uh, the most remarkable I, I tried i can't remember the name of the firm i actually tried to look them up recently because i wanted mm-hmm. to reach out because it actually had a really big impact in my trajectory mm-hmm. then when i was in uh, architecture graduate school i worked for um, a firm that did healthcare and interior design in philly um, and it was one of those situations where it was also just the most remarkable experience. Um, they gave me a big desk. They gave me responsibility right away. They gave me autonomy and meaning and they fostered growth. There was a, there was what in hindsight was pretty notable difference between what they were offering me as an architecture student and what they were offering the four or five, uh, interns that they hired for interior design programs. Hmm. I'm not sure if that's an architecture interior design thing or if that's a sexist thing. <laughs> There's probably some of both, but hmm. it was, man, those guys were just in the back talking the whole time, organizing the material library, but in reality, they weren't doing anything. And I hmm. was, but they weren't given any work to my knowledge. And I was brought on right away and I did that for two summers and it was absolutely you know, mind blowing to me. I, I loved every part of it. I love doing, I still love doing reflected ceiling plans. Like I think they're the coolest, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think they're the coolest thing. Well, I mean, if you go into it's... a room, like right now I'm looking out at this room and the ceiling is the dominant kind of feature. And, hmm. and so the, the, I think Typical it's the most architect. Yeah. We just look up, we look, we yeah. look at all that stuff. I, yeah. I think look that's at pretty everything. normal. Yeah. You're not going to get any arguments from me on the unheralded joy of RCPs because Honestly, as much as we spend on the floors, we will have us walking in there looking up and it's just like, oh, uh, two by two ceiling tile or, or it's something more exciting. And it was always the more exciting ceilings. You're like, Ooh, look what they did. That's oh, nice. yeah, I'm sure. I'm <laughs> yeah. sure if you went to Daily or DZine right now or, or Divasari, I'm quite certain that every project you'd see, you would not see a single bit of like, you know, gridded ceiling tile in anything. Oh, yeah. 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 I look back at old projects and I see photos with gridded ceiling tiles and I'm, and I, I see like the difference in what a designed, even a designed gridded ceiling tile and one that was yeah. just oh, thrown yeah. in there based on standards or whatever. And yeah. a lot of times working in public school work, it is like a design standard that they say what it has to be. And you're just shaking your head. It's like, it could be so much better. Yeah. Does it have to be? <laughs> I see like, those and I'm just, yeah. oh, that, that's it's sad when I see those in the photographs of the, the spaces that I've worked on. Well, of Cormac, what about you and your early internships? Do you have any good stories? Well, I, well, I did want to ask Michael before we move away from Michael. It's like, so you had the experience with the design build firm where you were working in an office and working mm-hmm. out in the field. When you were working with the architecture firm in grad school, did you have a similar experience where you had kind of more faceted kind of experiences? Or was it really kind of like you were butt in seat at the drafting table? I was butt in seat. I was button seat at the drafting table. I mean, occasionally we go to we go to, uh, take measurements in that on site or something like that. But I really wasn't included in the included in the meetings with clients or with with consultants the way that I would like to. Like kind of looking back on it now that I know more, it would have been nice to be included in more of those. And I, I, I got to think that the consultants would have been fine with that. In, in most cases, right. I'm 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 presentable. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I shower. Yeah. I don't. I don't shout in the middle of things and start turning over tables. Like I, I would. <laughs> what? I would have been. I would have been a reasonably quiet person who knew when yeah. to keep his mouth shut. I think. I hope. Mm. I mean, the one thing that we're always hoping for is interns are kind of like sponges. Maybe not necessarily the whole scene, but not heard. But at least mm. just kind of like absorbing what is going on and understanding where they're at and what they're experiencing as part of like that growth. Because. Well, I know we'll get into the, like the idealized internship and, and I, I can kind of expand on what I'm talking about there. But so Evan, you want to hear about mine? You've heard about I it. Do. I do. I want to hear about your, well, I, I want to hear, hear a good story about Cormac and an in, as being an intern. Uh, one of my favorite ones. So after second year, I saw a article in the newspaper looking for a draftsman and this was the early mid nineties. 
So draftsmen at that time meant a hand draftsman. And I just had my 2D drafting courses and stuff like that. So I'm like, sure, I'm qualified to do this. And so I, I went and I worked for them. And in fact, I actually started working for them. Um, I applied early. They were looking for a summer intern. But this happened to be in at spring break. And they're like, hey, do you want to come in? Just give it a shot and see. You know, what? And I'm like, sure, why not? So I started working like not quite when I was finished with second year. And so I go in. And they're working on a project that, and Evans heard this story a lot, but was working on a project that was a church in Montgomery, Alabama, that was, we were you know, doing all the hand drafting. And so they asked me to do the floor plans. Never done a floor plan in my life. Did they sit down and tell me what a floor plan needed to look like? They gave me some drawings and said, this is what we want you to produce. Here Looks is like the this. sketches. Exactly. Right. Here's the sketches. Do that. <laughs> Okay. So mm -hmm. I did. And this was back in the day when, because everything was out on the table. So you could see it. And they walked up to it. And they're looking at it. And I'm almost done. And they, I'll give the shortened versions. Basically, they looked at it. They're like, well, this is crap. And untaped it, balled it up and said, let's start over. But this time we'll show you how to do a floor plan. What an interesting approach. I mean, it's a great way for them to kind of just see what you would do, knowing, probably yeah. knowing that they were going to have to throw it away and start over. And there's a lesson in there for you at the same time about not asking questions and, you know, and things like things like that. But at the same time, like, it's kind of cool that they just said, show us what you can do right. without any repercussion. Like there was there was nothing bad that was going to happen. I'm that except pretty a slight positive. Eco -bruising. Yeah, I'm pretty positive. I didn't even know how to use the rapidograph pens. So. It was just like the thickness of the pens, so the triple lot, the double lot, let's get a one or line two or weights. three in, in all right. the line weights and what line weights meant back then. When we were creating drawings and we didn't really know what any of that stuff meant. So it's like, oh, a dash line really does mean something different than a big heavy line. And none of that was it really talk, but, but, and you may, you brought up a good point because this is one of the things that I always tell, tell the interns that are working with me is. Like, I, I want you to try, I want you to try to work on this, but get to a point where you've exhausted all efforts of under, of your understanding, then come back to me and let's talk about it. Let's talk through it. I don't want you to struggle or suffer or, or anything like that, but I do want you to try it. And that was the one thing that I didn't do when I was, when they came up and crumbled up the paper right in front of me. It's just like, like, ah, oh, okay, well, it was crap. And you just accepted it. I just accepted it. But, but then from that point on. It was the best I, crap you've ever done, though. You were, at, you were like, at that point in time, I was like, puffed hard. up. I was like, look, look how great this is. And yeah. nope. <laughs> crumble, nope. crumble, crumble. Chuck. Like, nope. Yeah. But that really did kind of lead me on the path in my future of always ask questions. I, I, I was the dude who pinned whether it was, you know, through my own internships or, you know, my early career. And even today pins a piece of paper on my desk with a big question mark. People mm -hmm. would come up and say, what does that question mark mean? It's just like question everything. Like, well, what does that mean? That's exactly what it means. Question everything. <laughs> <laughs> you really mean what you just said? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yes, I do. <laughs> so, so it That's was cool. this, it was this kind of like humbling experience of like, okay, I don't know what they're asking me to do. And so now it's, let me ask the questions. Let me figure out what it is that they're doing instead of me going away and say, oh yeah, I know how to do it. And then spend a week doing it only for them to come up and crumble it up and chuck it in the bin. Do you find that sometimes some of the people in the firm want the opposite where they don't want people asking questions. They want people to look at court, look it up themselves. You know, that is an interesting question because I I'm working with some people right now who they are notorious for asking lots of questions and lots of people don't like working with them. And I love working with them because one, I know that a, they're looking at the task. They're, they're trying to understand the task. And if they, the reason that they're asking the question is because either they don't understand it, they're not clear on exactly what the intent that I asked them to do is, or they just want to make sure that they're understanding how to proceed forward. And, and I'm, 100% on board with them asking and over asking questions. Like I can, I can field and I'm 
seeing, you know, my, my little Zoom chat and the little numbers kind of clicking up as we're talking about people who are asking questions that once we're done, I'll, I'll have to go and answer, but they're asking questions and I want them to ask questions. I need them to ask questions because I can at the end of the day, because where this is coming from is we've had some interns where they'll come in, I'll give them a task and I'll say, okay, do you understand what I'm asking you to do? Oh yeah, yeah not a problem. Like, okay. So then I come back maybe a week later, two weeks later, and the task is, hey, have you completed this? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come take a look at this. And I look at it and I'm like, this isn't what I asked you to do. And I'm not mad at them because it's not right. I'm sort of ticked off that they didn't ask the questions of, one, let's check in. F failing of, a, of the PM, I should have checked in a lot more to make sure that they were doing it. But I sat down with, with that particular intern. I'm like, okay, look. A lot of people are going to get frustrated with you um, because if you don't ask the questions, they don't understand if you do or don't know what you're doing. And if they give you a task and you say, yeah, not a problem, and you go and you do it, and then you come back and you clearly demonstrate that you don't know how to do it, that's when you need to ask the questions. But also in turn, if I'm expecting somebody, let's say I'm, I'm asking somebody to do an RCP. And they say, yeah, I can do an RCP. And then they go off and they do an RCP. If they've never done an RCP before, why should I expect them to get it done right the first time? And that was where, you know, back to my own experience, it's like, if I've never done a floor plan, I mean, I'm in second, not even done with second year. And if I'm in second year doing a floor plan, they all went to school at the same school that I went to. They know what is taught and what's not taught in second year. And there is no, there was no like architect, like floor plans where we all know what a second year floor plan looks like and how void of information and everything else is. An right. architectural floor plan is chock full of information. And so if they didn't go through the effort of teaching me how to do a floor plan, how would, how would I know how to do a floor plan? So well, I'll share one story uh, because this one is something that still... I don't know if haunts me is the right word, but this was one of those things where <laughs> I think it was second year, second or third year. And I went to work at the firm that I ended up working at after I graduated. Uh, so this was like my first kind of taste of what it was like to work in this firm. And there happened to be a VP who was kind of a business development person. And at one point she had asked me to like pin up some of my projects on the wall, my school projects, like pin them up on the wall. They're exciting. Like, well, let's get people <laughs> inspired around here. And I was very kind of digitally savvy. I was one of the, er, one of the two people in my class who kind of early adopter of technology, which I, you know, has kind of created the course that I've been on ever since. Right. So I had these beautiful, glossy, large format prints of this airport project that I had done. It was third year because this was a third year studio. And I actually, Cormac, you and I talked about this on a previous episode where I pulled up my early form Z models, oh, like shit. the space trust that was like in this con, it was this really complicated geometry. And of course it was a school project, right? Yeah. And so I had pinned pin this large format thing up on the wall. And, and then meanwhile, like I'm working on, the most rudimentary plans, uh, I'm trying to remember what they were called, but they were like called A diagrams or something for schools where there were the simple P line outlines of rooms with an X through them with a marker for every space in the building. And it was all about how schools got funding through the state, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was working in this entitlements department as an intern where I was drawing very basic CAD plans and microstation but I could do that. And, and then there was somebody next to me who was working on the spreadsheet version of that same thing. And they were helping schools get funding so that they could do projects, which hopefully we could do, right? So it was like this, this whole system. But anyway, this VP comes walking down the hallway with some prospective clients. And she doesn't know maybe where I'm sitting, but she, she points at this thing on the wall and says, and here's a project that we're working on at the local airport. Right. Totally like takes credit for this project <laughs> that was on the wall. Oh, and gosh. I'm looking, I'm like, are you serious? Like, 
that just told me everything I need to, needed to know about that person when she right. did that, right? And, and I, I was blown away. And, and I'm like looking around like, does anybody else see what's going on here? This is wild. <laughs> oh my gosh, so it's the old trope about the, about the architecture firm not giving credit where credit is due, but it's a whole new twist on it where they're taking credit for something. Like it's, not, it's not just that they're not giving all the, all the, all the uh, team members credit for the work. Right. They're actually taking credit for work they had nothing to do with, but have yeah. I mean, they employed the intern who did that for a school project, and 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 just totally shifted the narrative. And wow, <laughs> it was, was it the same experience. person who asked you to put it on the wall? Who yes, showed it? It was. Oh, it was. Oh, wow. So yeah. they knew it wasn't. Wow. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, wow. if it was like somebody from marketing what? who saw something up there and just kind of assumed didn't that know. that's kind of what I, that's but, what yeah. I thought. But then I thought, yeah. how would you not know you don't, you have an airport project? Like that seems like right. the kind of project that even a big firm <laughs> yeah, exactly. would be aware. Of. They'd be like, oh, we have the airport. Like we're exactly. designing a, yeah. a from scratch airport. I lasted longer at that firm than she did. I'll just say that. Oh, yeah. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, man. Well, well, what I'm curious about is, I mean, we we shared a little bit about our internship experiences. How have you seen that internship programs? How how firms have changed or evolved their internship programs from when we were? Because when we were interns, I think it was just really like th this is how we do it. Like this is how we we bridge the gap between school and the profession and there's only a limited number of spots. I think this is still the case. There's a limited number of spots that firms provide for internships. There's kind of a competitive nature to that, depending on the firms and the location, obviously uh, that's going to make a, a, an impact in that. But, but I think now it's, it's much more intentional. It's like, we see the talent wars, right? We see how people are trying to attract talent. And so I've seen a shift in, developing legit internship programs where there's a lot of strategy going into those. I've, I've been through that process myself. Have you guys seen things shift over the years rather? Oh, yeah. Because I think, I think the, the thing that I experienced before this shift was that it was really reactive. It was like, what are, what are we going to do with this intern today? Yeah. And I, that, and it was always like, I don't know. What what do you have? No, what do I you mean, have? And it was kind of horse trading at that point, but I've seen that change. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, in, from my point of view, and, and, you know, I have to preface it by saying I'm still in the academy, and I'm, so I'm not really seeing what's happening day to but day. you're but hearing. I am hearing, and, I, and I'm seeing it certainly when the firms come down and, at career day and that kind of thing and start looking at people. It's it's mostly the same as it was back then, but it's bifurcated. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a subset of, of firms that are, in, like you said, I love that word, that are kind of using intentionality to kind of say, mm -hmm. okay, let's start with the idea that we're going to have interns and then let's figure out how that's going to be. I had someone come up to me two weeks ago and he said that he just got, he just got approval from his firm to do like a design build studio with, with 10 interns this summer. <laughs> and so now they're looking for 10 interns that, that nice. they're going to build something. They don't even know what they're going to build yet, but he's been outfitting the shop. So they have a, you know, he's been basically creating a, a design build space for these students. And I was like, are you kidding? Like I was jumping out of my skin. I was like, I want to sign up for that. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> yes, right? And he's like, oh, you want to help out? Like help run it? And I was like, no, I want to do it. Like I want yeah. you to teach me how to like, <laughs> teach me how to teach me how to make a connection with non, you know, like, you know, some kind of special specialized growl. Like I want to know this stuff. And so um, there definitely has been a, uh, there has been a bifurcation, but I, I frankly, most of what I see is kind of what you're describing, which is, there is a scarcity mindset on time yeah. from the firms. And I don't care what your scarcity is. I don't care if you have no food. If you have no food, you're, you're only going to be thinking about food. How do I get food today? And you're not going to be making plans to you know, get food for tomorrow. And if you don't have money, you're only thinking about money. And if you don't have human connection, you're only thinking about loneliness. And if you don't have time, you're only thinking about getting through today. And the scarcity mindset on the firm from the firms many times, uh, from an outsider's point of view, when I look at that, I think you've got to be kidding me. I mean, the students will fly out there on their own dime, which no other mm -hmm. profession I know does that. Right. They'll 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 be begging the begging the uh, firms to to spend some time with them. They'll but once they get there, the person at the firm will say, "I'm really sorry, I have a meeting today," 
Uh, so, so I only have 15 minutes and they flew across the country for 15 minutes and they're still likely to get hired because they got in front of them. I mean, the, the, that's the worst system there is except for every other system. <laughs> so yeah. every other system that a student <laughs> might pursue will be like, I cold, you know, I cold emailed someone and sent them my resume. Well, that's worth about zero points. If I cold emailed them and called them on the phone, that's worth about 10 points. If I got my face in front of them, that's worth about a thousand points, like in terms yeah. of like your likelihood of getting a job in my experience. And there's a decent amount of research that I've read that kind of backs this up. And, and um, your odds of getting a job uh, once you've gotten in front of them are a thousand times higher than your odds of getting a job by just kind of sending something to them. So this kind of comes back to the, I know we're talking more about the firms right now, but it comes back to what can the students do? Mm-hmm. And a big part of what the students can do is... Um, is two parts. <laughs> One part is, uh, as a student, you want to uh, you want to find a way to turn that cold email into a visit. So when you write the when you write the cold email, you can say, "I'm going to call you next week to follow up." That way, you kind of it's not creepy when you call, or it's less creepy maybe that you right. called. Yeah. And then you call next week and you follow up and you say, "I'm going to be in Chicago on the second and third of next month." Even if you have no plans to be in Chicago on the second and third of next month, yeah. are you available to meet on at 10 a.m. on the third? And if they say yes, then you better start looking for flights. And if they say no, you don't have to look for flights. But the kind of presumptive approach, uh, one of my other jobs was I used to sell credit cards <laughs> on the phone. Um, I was a telemarketer and that was, I wasn't very good at it. But the people who are good at it just kind of assumed you were going to buy it, right? When they, you know, because I could hear them, they were all in the same room. And I was like, how does she keep selling so many? And so kind of taking the presumptive approach of giving someone, instead of saying like, when is a good time to meet, which people hate that. It's like overwhelming. You start looking through your calendar, you don't know where to begin. But if you give people two days that you're going to be out there, even if you're not planning on it, and then they say yes, then you just go ahead and make it. So the first kind of job of a student is to treat it like a design project, follow up with phone calls, get your get your body out in front of them. And the second part is kind of be the kind of person when they meet with you that they want to work with, like ask mm-hmm. questions about their work. Yeah. As a student, ask questions about their work. Um, and like not parlor game questions that are like, but like real questions. Like I was trying to figure out, I saw on your website, you have this and how, how does that meet the ground? Or I drove by this public building that you guys have finished and I couldn't believe it. You know, what's what that parking lot looked different than others I've seen. It looked like there was more shade trees. How'd you, how'd you get them to allow that? Yeah. Doing your homework to the audience mm-hmm. that you're actually going to be meeting in front of to show them that not only do you have interest in just a job, but a job with them. Right. And and then there's a, there's this kind of other thing where the, you know, the, um, so when I used to be program, I was program chair between 2007 and 2011. And one of my jobs as program chair was I was, I would kind of host the career day that we'd have. We'd have maybe a hundred firms come in. Mm-hmm. Well, we'd have a hundred and then the the, the economy tanked and then we'd have like 45 and then we'd have a yeah. hundred again. But at the kind of end of the day, I'd be strolling through the, the venue and kind of saying, Oh, who'd you, who'd you like? And what, what looked good? <laughs> which students, which students are you thinking about? And they, they have two stacks of resumes, one really high of rejects and one maybes. And they pull the maybes out. And I was appalled at how easily mm-hmm. they were fooled, appalled <laughs> at how easily <laughs> they were fooled. Of course, I don't know what the firms were looking for, but if they had just asked me, and of course, I've since taken upon myself to volunteer, but I think this would be true in any field, but especially in architecture where the faculty know the students in a way that no other faculty know, especially undergraduates right. in any other field, the way that they knew in architecture. And it's in everyone's best interest to assign good students to good firms and yeah. uh, you know to, to connect good students with good firms. And, and, and so I just think, oh my gosh, if you had just asked me, or can I give you some advice? Like, and it's, oh, they always err in the exact same way. It's always, they go for the, uh, for the gregarious, you know, for the outgoing person who's a native English speaker and who they would love to hang out with. And there is a place for that in a firm. And I would too, I mean, all things being equal, um, why not take the person who's fun to be with, <laughs> but the, all things were not equal. And they were passing over people with heavy accents that they were maybe afraid that they would have to hire a lawyer to figure out how to get get them a visa. Or maybe they were they were um, uh, they were passing over really, really amazing people who were quiet and not taking credit for group projects, saying this is a group project where someone else may present the same project and just imply it was their own. (laughs) And so you get the kind of person by doing that, you're almost pre-selecting the kind of person like like the woman who showed your airport project because they're. They're the kind of people who are, 
who are good at convincing people in a very short Talk amount of time up. that they yeah. want to do it. Now, there's the other side of that too. The students need to, if you're shy as a student, suck it up. Like you need to be, you need to fake it till you make it. You have to pretend like you're the kind of person because nobody wants to hire someone who's going to be a problem and it's going to kind of shrink to the corner and be afraid of their own shadow or uh, aloof or, um, uh, or fearful or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. And I think one of the things that, that, what you're talking about with the advice of students being able to turn that on, even if that isn't who they are all the time. I feel very much like that. And I feel like I've gotten even more and more like that as I've grown older, which is like, you need to be the outgoing person when you need to be the outgoing person. Right. Right. And then you can recede back into your normal person when you need to do it. But it, you very, this very much is a relationship driven business. And some of the things that you're talking about that students need to do to get in front of firms, firms do the same things to get in front of clients. Yeah. And, and so it, you you may think that you're just going to do this for now to get a place in a, in a firm. You're going to do this your entire career in one way or another. It, it, yeah, it's certainly an audition to, what you will be doing for the rest of your career. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and I think our profession in particular, is certain, certainly in the corners of our profession that overlap with the academy, can be uh, very dismissive of people who are outgoing or extroverts or gregarious. Like they can think that somehow they're Philistines, they must not read a book, they're not serious. Like there's this kind of like, this kind of like, oh, they, they want the monk. Like they wanna, they wanna revere the architect monk. Um, and so the students sometimes, even I've seen students who I believe to be quite outgoing, decide to not be, <laughs> just kind of mm-hmm. pull it all in to be kind of the serious artist. And it's like, man, like, like this is nuts. And as someone, I mean, this sounds ridiculous because it's very much an extrovert's world. Um, but as someone who's an extrovert, I certainly have felt like people kind of, you know, as an academic, other academics have certainly kind of looked at me like, I don't know. You know, he goes to all the all the Virginia Tech football games. He must not be a serious thinker. Like he's a, you know, he, yeah. he really he's really really he's you know really happy to kind of go out with a bunch of friends at night. Many of whom aren't even architects, and 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 so he he must be someone who's not committed to our to our profession or to our field, which of course is ridiculous. Totally. Um, but but it is it is part of the kind of bias of the of the field. So there's this kind of two sided thing going on where when people are hiring. They want to hire someone that they want to grab a beer with, but when people are kind of deciding who that they want to kind of emulate, they're emulating the they're emulating the the people who are who are sometimes a little bit on the other side of that that continuum. I just had a, a flashback when you said that because um, my fifth year, so my thesis year at Auburn, my wife and I had our first child, and oh, cool. my professor basically pulled me into his office and said, "I'm really kind of concerned about you moving forward." because you're not going to be committed enough exactly exactly that was <laughs> oh it he was gosh. like you need to eat breathe wow and, that is some know. 1950s oh, stuff oh, yeah. like you like, have you have a kid so you're not you're no longer I'm, serious I, I was not committed to i was not serious about both my education and also the profession and so he was encouraging me to drop out even though i was like at the time and it was like kind of like the, the big producer of the most work or or whatever and i had already interned for four years so i like i actually had built projects by the time i had graduated and i was just like how can i not be committed to this i mean you know, like i'm <laughs> crazy like, and it was just it was just this like wow. architecture doesn't have to be every second of your life to be committed to architecture as a profession did that put self doubt into you when that person put that on you? I'm I'm oh, curious yeah. because yeah. I think we yeah so so we see this all the time. We see this a lot with women who they're bearing the children right and and they leave and there's no place for that position when they come back when they want to come back. A lot of times, like we've lived through this as well, right? And yeah. and for you to experience that, I have to assume that a lot of people experience that as oh, well. Yeah, it's absolutely. like this one overbearing person is placing their perspective and their values onto you and they have no place there. I I share that story with a group of students that we were working with. um, And one of the older students basically kind of pulled me off to the side later on and said, I kind of experienced the same thing. I've got a family. Mm -hmm. They didn't really feel like I was committed. I'm like, you know what? This is your opportunity to prove them all wrong. I was like, there's a way to balance all of this stuff out, obviously. But if they're telling you that because you've got other commitments that you can't commit to what they're asking you to do, 
this is your time to show them. Because then later on, when you are in front of a prospective employer, you can tell them the challenges that you overcame to complete your degree, as well as raising a young family, which mm -hmm. then they show it's like, wow, this person is like really can do it all kind of thing. And, and that's sort of sometimes what we're looking for is the, you know, the, 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 the jack of all trades kind of person. Yeah. I just wanted to go back to something Michael said earlier, which was if we in a firm just ask the faculty who oh. we should talk, that is a secret weapon. And there are not enough relationships like that that I've seen where I have that person I can tap on the shoulder and say, hey, who should I be looking at in the class of 2024 to come work in my firm and have a relationship with someone like you, Michael, to actually give me a list of five names of like, these are the top ones. These are the, the ones that need to float to the top of your stack so that you're not looking at the wrong, you're, you're not interpreting the information incorrectly because the presentation of the resume, if there hasn't been in-person interviews, is all you have to go off, right? And so if somebody is really good at but even creating the in -person a piece of paper versus not, but even yeah. Even the in-person interviews, I mean, it's funny. Yep. It's amazing. Okay, so first of all, you hit you hit the nail on the head. I mean, if there's a current, if there's, we could do a 20, if we had to do a 20 second podcast on this topic, that's all I would say is like, <laughs> ask your, ask the faculty, like why on earth would you, we don't know exactly what you need. You may need someone who's can really good at, at 3D modeling. You may need someone that you can, who can play but golf a with a potential client, you, but, yeah. but in general, I'm not in that debate of do you as a sports fan, do you draft for do you draft for talent or do you draft for position? You draft for talent every time. Mm -hmm. And you just, you, you find the best person. And then especially with technology magnifying the difference between a great person and a good person. I mean, if you guys look back at your careers and anyone listening looks back at their careers, I am quite certain that within two days of working at a firm, you pretty much sized up everyone. You knew who was competent and who was not. Um, so it happens remarkably quick where they're conf competent, but it still takes two days. It does not take 20 minutes. Like there's a, it happens something greater than 20 minutes and something less yeah. than two days where you kind of size, size someone up. And, and it's not that you're never wrong, but it's pretty rare. It's pretty rare that I've been like, oh, I thought they were really competent, but they weren't, or that they were really incompetent, but they turned out to be competent. That does happen, but it's exceedingly rare. But in 20 minutes, it just, it's really, really hard. It is really, really hard to get, to get your handle on, get a handle on that. And so you have these people that are, that are accessible to you. If you cultivate those relationships, even if you don't, I mean, faculty love to talk to you about their students. Now I will say some tips for the, for the firms listening. Um, you're way better off calling faculty than emailing or texting because nobody wants to put it in writing that this student's crap and this student's strong, right? <laughs> I mean, it's point. like, that's Good like point. crazy. Like you should never ask for a recommendation. And you shouldn't also, if you're, if a student, this people do this all the time too, they'll <laughs> write me an email and say, you know, so-and-so asked me if, if, uh, you know, if to provide a recommendation. And I'm thinking to myself, this is a mediocre at best student. I'm not putting that in writing. You know, I'll just write back and say, call me. But most people I know will just say, yes, I can confirm that this student is competent or something, but they're not like, they just don't want the future trouble. So right. and the best, the best I've heard is, um, I heard about someone and I started doing it myself when we hire a faculty, um, I heard about someone who calls after hours, a reference calls a reference after hours and leaves a message where we're thinking of hiring Jessica, give me a call back to this number tomorrow if she's fantastic. So then you've, then you've kind of, then you're, then, then if they, if they took the time the next day to call you back, then they have the, they have the opportunity to rave about Jessica. But if they because didn't. Because you want, you want to advocate for Jessica if Jessica is awesome, right? Like yes. It, it, it should, it, yes. yes. I, I, that's a great approach right there. Yeah. yeah. So the, um, so the, the, the way that, you know, and it's, if I know from at Amber book, uh, we have on the order of, I don't know, 15 people who work there and it's just. They're all amazing, <laughs> but that's because we're actually pretty quick to fire people uh, who are not. And the difference between a very good person, I mean, a hundred years ago in a pin factory, people cranking the thing and stamping out pins. Um, I got to think the difference between a top 1% person and a top 30% person was like whatever, two pins an hour, like 2% or something <laughs> like that better or 5% better. <laughs> but with, with technology, the different and with the kind of the knowledge economy, my experience from Amberbook is that the difference between a 
a top 1% person and a top 30% person is yawning. It is yawning. And I suspect that if you think back to everything bad that's happened in your career, almost all of it can be traced back to a bad hire. Almost all of it, a, a, an avoidable bad hire. And if you think about like everything great that's happened in your firms you've worked at, almost all of it can be traced back to a really good hire. Mm -hmm. So there's really nothing more important. I mean, this goes without saying, and everything's more, nothing's more important than reflected ceiling plans. Nothing's more important than hiring good people. But it is true in, in a, in a world of time scarcity, there is almost no limit to the amount of time that one could put into cultivating relationships with faculty, calling up when you're in town or near town, asking to sponsor studios. I mean, and it's cheap. It is really inexpensive yeah. for a firm to say, hey, we would love to um, sponsor a competition to design a school. Um, and we want to give $500 for first place and 300 for second place. Any, any takers. And it is really easy for a, for a studio to be like, oh, we'll take that. Yeah. I, I was going to have them design something I hadn't decided yet. I'll have them design a school. Now we have a competition. And then we can bring these guys in to review the students. Well, these guys can come in and review the students and they can see the student work. And, and instead of just interpersonally interacting with them, you can see them talking about their work. And, and you um, probably get a couple of touch points throughout the studio semester, mm -hmm. right, to, to actually see the progress. To mm -hmm. you, you start to get to know people, then you get to know them a little bit better. And then by the end, you have a pretty good picture of what the... What yeah, and not only those 15 or 20 students in that studio, but you're meeting other faculty while you're there because you're in town and you're and you're mm -hmm. taking you're taking the students for a tour of your project that's 20 minutes away. And if you're if you're if you're in a if you're in a city with a university, you're attending the lectures and you're kind of mingling after the lectures at the receptions and the return on investment in that in in the medium term, I, I can't even imagine you know, how to quantify it. But if you could, I can't even imagine how valuable it would be. I was going to say that like this, this strategy of just getting involved is a great strategy for developing yeah. a good internship experience yeah. for both sides of that equation. Yeah. And to be clear, this is not the job of HR. I don't care how big your firm is. I know in, prepar in preparation, totally agree. in yeah. preparation for this, I actually called, there's a, a guy named David Keith. He's the CEO of a firm called Hanbury. They have about 150 people. And I don't know anyone better than him at doing this. Like he, he used to be at a different firm and it was the same way. He would call everybody before he came into town for the career day. Um, if he was going to be in town for any other reason, he'd say, I'm in town. If anyone needs a review, um, he, when he, uh, he arranges all of his interviews beforehand, he looked, he looks over the resumes when he comes in for career day and, and he's the only, he was the first one. Others have done it since the first I knew of, he, he would get a room in the, in the, he would get a room in this conference room, the conference center. No one else thought to do this. And he would just schedule back to back to back to interviews one on one with people that he was that were already pre recommended to him. Then he brings them all out to his firm together. He kind of says, like, you guys are the team, like you guys are the group. You're gonna get to know each other. You you'll probably already know each other anyway from school. But if you work here, you'll be working together and and we have a mission and we have meaning and you will have autonomy and you will be brought on to projects. So uh, some of this is from my conversation with him in preparation for this, but most of this I already knew from talking to him over the years, he will bring them. So first of all, he's as the CEO of this 150 person firm and principal, he is the person who is most involved in, in maybe not the last few years, but he said he let it go for a few years, but, but he is the person who was the most, by far the most involved in scheduling the students and following up with them and really getting to know them being the talent scout right? being the talent <laughs> scout and then right. and then he he has them working with him at the very beginning to chase projects and then when they get one he sends them with the project all the way through to the end and then they get to see they get to see the whole thing and he, he explained to me that it was because of a, a hole in his his early career where yeah. he was just doing this stuff in the middle and he didn't get to see this stuff at the beginning or end. And he, so he didn't yeah. understand he wasn't yeah. meeting with the consultants or the clients and he wasn't, he wasn't there at the kind of stages where the, where people were talking about budget and, and, and program and that yeah. kind of thing. When I was at the firm that I was at, uh, we intentionally developed a, an internship program that the, the main goal was to get those students when they were done with it to go back and talk to other students and faculty and say that was the best internship program I've ever participated in. Oh, interesting. In. And so in order to do that, you have to actually do that. You have to back it up, <laughs> yeah. right? You can't, you can't program people to say what you want them to say. You right, have to right. deliver the experience that, you then, that they will then convey to others. Yeah. 
And we did exactly that. I mean, we were a firm that because of our location, that we were not considered as highly as many other firms. Like we were outside of LA, right? And so when interns want to find an internship program, they often first think of the big firms doing the signature work because they want to work on those projects and they don't know how those firms work. They don't know what the machine is like. And so we had a great opportunity because we were not one of those machines to give them an epic internship experience. And the way that we broke it down, and I, I want to share this because I think this is a huge opportunity for firms to evolve your internship programs to go from reactive to proactive, right? We talked about intentionality. Like, what what is your goal? Like, we wanted to change the perception of our firm for students and for faculty. And the way we were going to do that was by making something worth talking about. And so when those students came to us and they applied and received their internship, we had them buddy up with another one. And we had multiple studios in the office. And they would, with their buddy, basically go for two-week stints in each one of the studios working on a different kind of project at a different phase of the project. And so we had to be very intentional about mapping all of this out ahead of time so that that actually happened. So, the, you know, one of the things we kind of opened this conversation with was what has what has changed mm -hmm. uh, in internship programs, from my point of view, over the years. And by far the biggest change that I've shifted, I've seen is um, students have started talking to me about wanting to go to a firm that will that will assist them in pursuing licensure. Uh, and that was never, it was never on my radar when I was coming out of school. I didn't really even understand what licensure meant. I, I think if you had asked me about it, I, I wouldn't have been able to tell you anything about it. Right. And even 15 years ago, I don't think students ever talked about it, but they are saying, I want to go. And part of it, maybe they're telling me because I'm the licensure guy because of Amber book or, um, but I don't think so. I think it's actually like, it's actually really, really important to them that they, that they go to a firm and that's something that costs a firm like nothing like, right, you know, right. the, in terms of like, I mean, I mean, really a rounding error and they can charge a whole lot more money per hour for their for students of their license two years earlier than they would have been otherwise. And so one of the things that surprised us the most at Amber book is how quickly ideas disseminate within the architecture community around licensure in particular. Mm -hmm. So recently NCARB decided to get rid of their fill in the blank numeric questions. Well, they announced it like on a Monday and by Monday afternoon, like everybody knew it. Like there didn't yeah. seem to be, I, I, I didn't come across anyone where I was like, guess what? And they were like, yeah, I heard about that an hour ago. Like <laughs> uh, it was, yeah. it's, it's amazing how changes in that. However, <laughs> given how quickly people are aware of the rules, it is also amazing to me that people aren't getting licensed younger than they used to. It used to be, as you guys know, you had to get all your hours first before right. you could sit for licensure. That's yeah. almost never the case. I don't think it's the case in any state. And yet <laughs> there seems to be uh, no, no kind of backing up earlier into your career the time you get licensed, despite the fact that you're likely that the, the stats show that you're more likely to pass with when you're younger. And nobody who's done it when they were older wishes they had waited that long. Nobody. <laughs> Uh, no one ever said, I wish I, I'm really glad I waited till I did to, to seek licensure. Um, the decent amount of research from AIA, you can go to their compensation calculator and you can see that someone who has licensed on average has about $6,000 more a year. And so if you're waiting 10 years to not get licensed, you're losing $60,000 of on average, and it could be much more, it could be much less than that, but you're losing, let's call it six, an expected value of $60,000 by waiting. And nobody with kids ever said like, oh, now I have time. Like, <laughs> now I have free time now that I have a family. Now, you mentioned you had your family in school, so that's a little different. If you have a kid in your fifth year, you're, there's probably never a good time. But it is right. a fact that it is a fact that for most people in their 20s and early 30s, uh, let's just call it 20s. For most people in their 20s, um, there is never going to be a better time for them to get licensed by almost any oh, measure. Absolutely. And yet we're always surprised. I'm always shocked by how rarely that's pursued. Well, you know, it's because, and this is just an opinion, but it's an opinion that I sort of experienced on my own, is that when you come into firms, people put a lot more cachet on your years of experience than they do about whether or not you're licensed. And so they're like, oh, you can't get licensed. You, you, you know, you've only got two years of experience. I mean, what, what do you know? I mean, if you have a license, then you're expected to be able to sign and seal a set of documents. And then they they start putting this kind of like pressure and stigma on 
the licensure of it being bigger and grander than it really is in certain cases where you might work for a bigger firm that you're never going to sign and seal a set of documents, like say in your first few years and stuff, and that there are going to be part of a project team. And the, then there really is no reason or no roadblock for you to get it earlier. But I, I experienced a lot. It's just like, you're, you're not ready for this. But then, you know, I also had this kind of like weird false impression of my own that in the army, when, you know, because I'd gone into the army before I became an architect, that you always had to be experienced in the next job before you could get promoted to the next job. And oh, so interesting. I was always like, I'm not ready to be an architect yet. I don't have enough experience. I haven't done right. everything. And they got to the point where even when we, the infancy of the show, where we were just like, you're never going to learn anything. And then now it would actually have finally taken it and been renewed m multiple times of my licensure. It's just now it's like, yeah, I should have never waited. There was really no reason for me to wait because there's no reason to wait. Yeah. But, but what you're talking about, I think is actually a little bit no more nefarious than what you're describing. Because there is, as you guys know, because you've talked about it a lot over the years, there is a pattern in our profession of pulling the ladder up once you get there. Yeah. And back to that kind of scarcity mindset, the scarcity is early design decisions, decision making. Mm -hmm. There's only so many decisions that can be made and uh, senior people tend to hold on to those deci that decision making capability to an extent that's probably not not beneficial to the building or to the firm. Right. And and so in the same way, they say, well, I wasn't licensed till I was 40. So therefore, if you got licensed at 25, what does that make me? Yeah. And there's a, there's a lot of that going on that I see. It's really kind of ugly and um, mm -hmm. awkward. And we, yeah. uh, I'm almost embarrassed for the senior people yeah, when they kind yeah, of take right. that position where you're like, you're like, dude, do you understand what you're saying? You're saying there's no way you could do this. But if they couldn't do it, then they wouldn't do it. And frankly, most firms charge a lot more money for a licensed architect oh, per yeah, yeah. hour. So, oh, absolutely. So yeah. from the from the firm's point of view, it's a no brainer. Exactly. From the from the you have a higher likelihood of getting a passing. You have you remember way more from school. You, yeah, you're missing out on a significant amount of experience, but you remember way more from school. I can't tell you how many people have kind of come to me and they're like, I just don't know how to study anymore. They, there's <laughs> totally, just something yeah. for, yeah. for those of you who are listening who are in your 20s, there will come <laughs> a time a where, you, right, <laughs> where you just don't remember how to study. It just don't. That's right. You wrote that book. Well, you just don't remember how to study. Right, and, right. and so just being able to kind of do that and I had found that it, um, of the people who show up at when I used to teach in person uh, ARE prep seminars for AIA chapters around the country, and I did over 50 of them, and each one was a whole week, like a three day weekend at least. The average age was mid 30s, but there were very few people in their mid 30s. It was a lot in their late 20s and a lot in their early 40s. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I cannot overstate the, the difficulty people have when they have a small child at home or small children at home. And they have to decide whether they're going to be engaged with that child after work or they're going to be studying for their exams after work. Yeah. And so the idea of waiting to me is, is uh, um, I, don't, I don't know where it comes from, but I think it kind of comes from an ugly place. We've had this conversation, Evan and I, it's just like, if, if I had to do it all over again, would I have? Like, absolutely not. I've now, with years of experience, and like I just said, it's like, there was no reason for me to wait. And I would encourage everybody take it earlier, closer to the time that you had graduated, if not licensure upon graduation, because that's, you, you said it best, is like, that is when you are in the midst of understanding how to study, understanding how to learn. I mean, as we're getting into the career, we're, you know, too busy, like learning how to like put together buildings and go to work and become an employee and things like that. We get further and further away from the understanding of like the academic study and the academic rigor that it takes to actually like pass a bunch of like very rigorous tests. And you, you said when NCARB announces things that it, it quickly appears when, when they finally said, well, we're doing away with the rolling clock. I was just like, really? Finally. Thank goodness. Cause like how many times I lost a test because of the rolling clock, because I just wasn't ready to finish a test or I wasn't ready to do this or when went from 3.0 to 4.0 to 5.0 and you're just like, well, why am I not done with this? 
So yeah, we had a big conversation about that for sure on this on the show, and that I agree that was that was a big deal. Yeah, but you say you know there's no reason why you shouldn't have done it earlier, but I think what I've seen is a lot of people opting out of getting licensed altogether because sure. they don't see somebody to aspire to be in this profession. And I'm, I'm kind of guessing here, but I, I think that that happens a lot. Or they I, say like, well, I am never gonna sign a set of drawings, so mm-hmm. I don't want that kind of liability. Yeah. There's definitely arguments like that that I've seen more and more sure. in recent years. So I wanna know why should people get licensed? What, what do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, for sure. It's funny you say you've seen more of it in recent years. I have seen less of it in recent years among young people, among people of a certain age, maybe, who are like, forget it, I waited too long. And I'd love to see the data on this. Maybe you guys know the the percentage of, anecdotally, people have always said, um, I have, that half of architects don't become licensed, don't mm-hmm. ever get licensed. Right. Um, I don't know if that number is true. It was ever true. I still don't know if it's true anymore. I'm quite certain that um, that'd be hard to measure because you'd have to say architects at what age, because we have people in their fifties and sixties getting licensed all the time. So you'd have to only survey people at the end of their career, I guess. And, 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 and then that would be such a lag, but the, yeah. the, um, the number of people who are interested in getting licensed or the percentage of architects who, who are interested in getting licensed in my world and all my worlds, uh, it's only going up so far, yeah. uh, year to year. It, it can't go up like this forever, but it's only been going up. The, I think for me, it's the people that I'm seeing that come from are people on the technology side of AEC okay, who see are frustrated with the lack of progress of architecture in general. <laughs> and because they're working on either users of or building tools for architects, and they don't see the adoption. They don't see things taking off. And they're like, well, this, this profession's going literally nowhere. And I'm not yeah. trying to be a negative person. I'm a licensed no, architect true. myself. But I, I just want to be real here that like when we say you should get licensed, I think the, the, com- the thing we re- need to be telling people is why they should get licensed. And so I you've talked a really little bit point. about it early on. It's like, okay, well, the pay is higher. You mm-hmm. do actually get to call yourself an architect. Like that, that might be one of the biggest reasons. You finish what you started when you decided to go through five years of school and all the tests and all the internships and all that stuff. Like these are all components of that. But like, is there is there more? Is there something else? Yeah. I mean, I've been, this is something, I'm glad you asked that because this is something I've been grappling with for a long time is why do people even want to get licensed? And mm-hmm. And like you said, the, the probably, and actually NCARB has a survey that just came out. I'm going to pull it up in a few minutes. I'll see if I can find it. And you can see why people want to get licensed. And it's really heartening because they have a list of, they have a list of probably 25 different reasons. And then they have the percentage of people who said that was a reason to, to get licensed. And, and they had over 4,900 people answered this particular question, if I remember correctly. So it was a pretty good sample size for our industry, nice. for our profession. I shouldn't call it an industry. I think I prefer to call it a practice or a profession, mm-hmm. but th- there's a pretty good sample size. And the all the top 10 were all like the purest of reasons. Like, I'll learn more. I'll, I'll be a better architect. I'll be able to call myself an architect. I'll finish what I started. I like learning this kind of stuff. And then the bottom ones were all the ones that were kind of external rewards. They were, I'll get paid more and I have to, my work is requiring me to, and I'll be able to, uh, uh, hold some life. I'll be able to hold more responsibility at work and stuff like that. It really wasn't the kind of, you know, naked careers. And that's because architects are amazing. Like they're like just a bunch of, we're just a bunch of golden retrievers that are just so happy to be able to kind of design a building and just yeah. so excited to be given the opportunity. And the ones who have not been in the profession that long that I deal with are the least cynical of the people that I know. And, and so from the point of view of someone who starts getting licensed, they really, frankly, probably don't know why they're doing it. Yeah. From the point of view of someone who started the process, they have that scarcity mindset where they just need their license. Like they just want to get it over with. Right. They don't want one more day of kind of, they don't have enough time after work to keep studying. From the point of view, from the people who have already gotten licensed, I can speak almost uniformly that once they have the license and they look back, they think, oh, I'm just a way better architect now. Like, I just know, I can't believe I didn't know that stuff. It's so important. Like, I use it every day. How did I, how was I going through the world and not being aware of the kind of relationships of these things, these different things before? But from the point of view of people who are not licensed, they don't want to hear that. Like, That's like, that's like annoying as hell to them being like, when you're done, you'll be, you'll feel like you'll be really glad that you learned all this stuff. They're like, shut up. Like I want to get licensed, but it is the case that they see it differently once they're done. If you guys will indulge me for a second. So I asked that question 
to a handful of people at the firm, a couple of principals, some HR folks, and also some marketing folks about Ooh. what is the importance of licensure. And, and if you bear with me here while I read this, because actually I think it's a really good statement is licensure. There is a confidence that an individual committed is committed to continued learning has in theory gone through the rigor of working on skill sets through every phase from contracts, concepts to CA um, that is needed for professional growth and allows for proper compensation. And it's the acknowledgement and respect from peers and clients that is gained. And what's interesting about that is that in a way, sometimes we kind of like push that idea to the side of it's like, oh, well, what does licensure really mean? And there is in from a from kind of a personal experience where Evan and I were at a dinner with a bunch of our friends and somebody had like just said, wait, Cormac, you're not licensed? I just out of the blue and it was just like it was this wave of like almost embarrassment. Spotlight. Yeah, it was just, just like just <laughs> and and it was it almost <laughs> felt as if, okay, now I'm judged as a lesser than all of them at the table is now don't I have a mm. seat at the table anymore? Because mm. I don't have a license. Am I not as knowledgeable as you and, and things like that? And so there is something to that. And and I do recognize that I had been, and you, you had said it best, I was like, I was my own roadblock to personal growth within the profession mm. because there are certain doors that are opened up by having a license. There are like, could I have been in senior management a lot sooner or or even higher than I am now? If I would have had my license a lot sooner because people were potentially not taking me seriously enough because I wasn't committed to the profession because I wasn't getting my license, because I wasn't licensed. And it's just, well, we can't market you as this. And just remember, I was always reminded, is, do you know how much money you're leaving on the table for yourself by not being licensed? Because we can't compensate you as an architect. We only get to compensate mm -hmm. you as a design professional three or something like that. So well, we should add FOMO to the list. Like, so the, the yeah, idea that yeah, you have a dinner, because yeah. yeah, that is, it's a huge deal, right? Yeah. When you go to buy a house, you're like, how can I, even if you never entertain, you're like, how would I entertain if I own this house? Like, how yeah. are you looking at a house to buy? Oh, yeah. It's the same thing. This kind of like you're at a dinner party and, and yeah, someone's like, you're not licensed. Are you kidding? Yeah. And it does command a different level of respect. Like, yeah. like this is a metric that people use in firms and outside of firms. And how many people do you meet that say, oh, I wish I was thinking about becoming an architect when I grew up. Like you literally are one. You yeah. are one right in front of them. And they get to, they, are re they respect that. Yeah. They, they respect it so much that, I mean, when was it? Was it last year, Cormac, at the AIA conference? When was it? Was it Obama? Maybe it was two years ago where he was, was like, I, I wanted to be an architect too. Right, yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. That yeah. was great. Yeah, yeah. And, and what was great about that speech is when he started talking about architecture, I thought, dude, don't do it. <laughs> like, you know, a lay person should not be talking about architecture. You're going to embarrass yourself. And to my surprise, and I probably shouldn't have been as surprised in hindsight, he did not embarrass himself. Oh, yeah, he yeah, starts yeah, talking right. about Jane Jacobs' book. Mm -hmm. He starts talking about he starts talking about what working with Billy Sin and, and Todd Williams. He starts talking about space and form and, and light and texture. And he, like it was like, are you kidding me? You got to be kidding me. He how the hell student. are you able? To, yeah, how the <laughs> hell are you able to? I mean, that's really just an aside, but how that maybe we should give him an honorary license. The, um, <laughs> the <laughs> it's interesting as we kind of have this conversation because I can't imagine ever having this conversation about it about a college degree yeah. but it's really mm -hmm. the same things you would say right yeah, you could yeah. say well you don't have to have one to work to work in the building profession yeah. you don't you know you could just learn you could just read the books you don't have to you don't have to have the accountability of actually taking the exams and completing the courses and passing them with high with acceptable grades and so forth and sitting through studio and but you know i could just watch youtube videos right and just learn all this stuff and so yeah sure i mean all over the place there are ways there are and certainly we all know people who are really competent people who maybe haven't taken all the kind of steps, but more often than not, the ones who have not taken all the steps and this being one of them is, are not people who are given the opportunities for fair or for not, but they've demonstrated to a third party that they have a certain kind of minimum level of competence. And yeah, well, I will say, uh, let me add to that. So that quote came from a principal who is a licensed architect who only completed his four year degree did not get his professional degree, did not get his master's degree, and went through the process of essentially the apprentice internship process, where in the state of Maryland, you under an architect for 10 years, 
and you've basically qualified for all of the different hours and everything through NCARB, you can actually sit for your licensure. Hmm. And that's what he did. And, and so it, it's interesting because he's coming from a perspective of he earned it and showed kind of his medal up against these, you know, academic architects. I don't want to, mm -hmm. I want to phrase it that way. It, it seems like. <laughs> no, but people who have gotten accredited degrees yeah, in, yeah. in architecture and probably many of the principals have gotten them from pretty good schools yeah, that, yeah. that people recognize and respect. And so, yeah, I could, I could imagine that that would be a back to the kind of FOMO or yeah. kind of like all of us kind of at some level thinking like a rapper, you doubted me and now I proved you all wrong. Exactly. <laughs> like, and now that I, now that I've been successful, like, you know, like you can finally, you can finally recognize the, the power that is I, but from the point of view of the firms. I think you could probably do the math in terms of why get licensed from the point of view of a firm. At first, I wasn't sure why the firms were so anxious to have their team become licensed. Now I can't believe that they're not all thinking this way. Right. Like now that I actually understand the numbers, but you know, if you just kind of run out the numbers, you can probably, if you're charging hourly, which not all firms do, but most do. And if you're charging more for licensed architects, which not all firms do, but most do. Mm -hmm. And even if you give someone a $6,000 raise when they get licensed, you're trying, you know, I don't know, I think I did, I did the back of envelope for a 70% utilization rate and you're billing at this and then you're billing at this. If you had, I just kind of looked at some numbers on the internet and it works out to be about $35,000, $40,000 after the, you've given the person the raise. Mm -hmm. So you're basically still giving them a desk, you're giving them a raise and you're still coming out $35,000 ahead. And yeah. if you have... If you have 50 people and who are ready to get licensed and they just haven't bothered yet and you start doing, I mean, that's real money. If it's 50 times yeah. $35,000, it's a significant amount of money. Well, I'll, I'll speak to my own experience again. So here I am building more and more specialized experience and the project types that we were going after were things that were in my wheelhouse that I could just do blindfolded. And here we're going after more and more pursuits and they want to use me and my experience as part of the leadership of this, but because I'm not a registered architect, they basically have to kind of like downgrade me as a team member rather than a team leader, even though technically I have all of the experience, I have all of the knowledge to be the team leader, but because I'm not licensed and the clients um, are looking for a licensed architect to be the team leader, that kind of put me in, in a position where essentially I had to have a babysitter or whatever you want to call it to essentially be the person ahead of me on a project that I should have been the leader of. Right. And, and, and to your original question, Evan, I mean, every, today's Wednesday, it was, we're recording this. So every Wednesday morning, I talk to people back to back to back to back from eight in the morning till noon, basically every 20 minutes. And I talk to people who are struggling with licensure or they just want to talk to me about study strategies or whatever. And anyone can sign up and I'm just talking to one after the other. And this happens at least once a week. This woman, she said she had studied a lot and she was failing and not just failing, but failing pretty badly. And I tried to talk her out of getting licensed. I mean, I don't mm -hmm. think that everybody should get licensed. It's, right. I think probably the only person who sells a subscription that is trying to talk people out of like, you know, continuing to do it. You want no, no, successful candidates. I want success. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I want success. Yeah. And so, you know, I said, well, let's just back up just to your question. Why do you want to get licensed? And she said, well, I, I, I don't know. I just, I want to, like you said, I want to finish this. And frankly, it probably hadn't occurred to her. She kind of stammered when I asked her because I don't think she had really thought about it. It was the next step and it was the next obvious thing to do. And in her case, I kind of came off of, off of it after talking with her a bit more, thinking that she probably is a candidate who should pursue licensure. But I talk people out of getting licensed all the time. I'm a huge fan of quitting. If, you know, if it's not for you, it's not for you. Yeah. But for every one person that is doing this and should quit, there are a hundred people who are not doing, who have not started this and it would not be that hard for them. Right. And not nearly as big a deal as they think. And it's because there's always some old dude in the firm and it's always old and it's always a dude <laughs> who's like, like, like way too into your licensure status and is asking you questions. Like, you're not really sure if they're on your side or not. Like mm -hmm. things he's saying are like, oh, you're taking PDD. Oh, I heard that one's a beast. I heard that's a beast. Which day are you taking it? Oh, you're taking it on the 21st? Okay. And then they follow up with you on the 22nd and they're like, how'd that test go yesterday? And you're like, you're thinking to yourself, did he want me to pass that test? Or did he not want me to pass that test? I'm not really sure. He kind of seems a little bit too gossipy and like kind of too much into the, <laughs> too much into the drama of my licensure quest. Um, 
That's why I'm a big fan of not telling anyone that you're mm -hmm. pursuing a licensure. Nobody has to know. And that way you can just tell people when you pass. Yeah, that that way you can just tell that way you can just tell people when you pass. Oh, uh, yeah. And you can be like, oh, you, you can be like, guess what? I passed the exam the other day. And, oh, I didn't even know you were taking it. That's great. Let me take you out for drinks. <laughs> and if you failed it three other times, nobody has to know. Nobody has to know. <laughs> there was a point where I stopped telling anybody that I was taking the test. I was to totally covert about it. And then one day I basically did it. I was just like, hey, by the way, I'm done. It's done. And they're like, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, huge. it was. You're a, you're a public figure. So it was kind of like, so like I said, I was, I was listening to you kind of struggle through this and I was shouting, I was shouting in the headphones myself, like, don't tell anyone you're taking it, but it does, it does humanize the process. Yeah, and, yeah. um, it's not, it's not that it's easy. It's just much more doable than most people think it would be. I, I think I did want to talk about it on the podcast as it was happening, much like what Evan was doing when it was happening for him too, because we all go through their struggles. I mean, people who wait later to do this are going through their struggles and understanding, hey, there are people out there that are doing the same thing that you are. And if they can do it, you can do it. Um, you know, you, you've got the drive. They had the drive. Just don't give up kind of thing. And, and we've, we've talked to a lot of people who are like, you know, I don't, I don't know if I can do it anymore. And it's just like, do you want to do this? Is, is this your passion? Is this what you feel like your calling is? And if it is, then it's worth the struggle. It's worth the effort to kind of push yourself through it. And if it's, if you're just like, well, it's a good paycheck. Like, well, then you, maybe you're not doing it for the right reasons. Right, right. <laughs> but in terms of difficulty, I mean, I think anyone who's working in a firm of a decent size can kind of close their eyes and imagine the least competent person yeah. in their firm that has a license. Yeah. Oh, and I just kind of say to you, and just, yeah, you guys are all, I could, you guys are picturing yeah. like, exactly, yeah. if you guys work together, you might've been thinking <laughs> the same person, right? So, <laughs> like yeah. you just kind of think of that person and you're like, are you kidding me? Like, you know, this right. is what I'm afraid. Like that person did it. That's motivation. Like, this, oh, yeah. is, this, yeah. is, this is crazy. This can't be that big a deal. <laughs> and the truth is it, it is and it, like, it's, it's one of these things that simultaneously is a really big deal, but kind of isn't. Oh, it's yeah. just, yeah. you know, it's just, it's just one more kind of, one more kind of tool in your tool belt. It's one more metal on your wall. Yeah. It's all also one more task that you can cross off and but by the same token it's kind of cool and special yeah when you get done yeah i, I want to bring us back to internships you guys yeah, yeah. you guys yeah, are, of course you're, you're, you've taken off here the thing that i want to get back to is okay so we've talked about all these different tests and the different skill sets that they require and basically knowledge bases it's like you're tapping into these different categories yeah. of knowledge and I want to get back to internships because I think a lot of times when people think internship, they think they're just going to be working on working on projects. Like yeah. you, you, you talked about your story, Cormac, as a draftsman, mm -hmm. right? And you're drawing floor plans. And I guess the question is, what should people be seeking out in internships? Because we talked, I talked earlier about building an internship program, which is different than having an internship. And an internship program leads me to believe that there's structure and intention and schedule and follow up and an exit interview and like all of these different, there's onboarding all the way to exit interview to get feedback, to make the next internship program even better. So my first piece of advice to students is look for firms that have internship programs, right. not just internships. And so when they offer an internship, ask the question, like, what is that? What is there a schedule? Is there a structure? But beyond that, it's like, what what else, what am I going to be doing? And I and so so this is a loaded question. I think it's kind of rhetorical at some point. But it's, should you be looking at other skill sets beyond architecture? And what I don't mean like outside of architecture, but I mean within architecture. But there's a lot of different roles that you can play as a team member on an architecture project. You could be a project manager. You could be in the sustainability group. And so like, like should students be looking for those types of things as well because i think the goal is is overall to have a good experience but to feed into your future career which then feeds into the tests that you have to take to become a licensed architect like there's all these different elements that make up a licensure just like i do believe there are a lot of different elements that make up an internship i'm curious what you guys think about that I'll tackle that first. The the general kind of consensus among students are probably first looking for a firm that does what they consider to be good design work. And then when they get the job, they kind of focus on the negotiating kind of what they're going to be paid. And of course, that's important and it'd be better to get more. But there's all these other things that they can negotiate or kind of seek. And it could be, it could be a firm that's going to kind of prep them for grad school. Maybe there's a bunch of 
faculty for a local grad school that are in that firm and that can kind of transition you into grad school. It could be uh, reasonable hours and a good work-life balance. It could be what I always look for, which is not so much looking for work-life balance, more work-life integration. <laughs> you know, they just seem like good people to hang out with and the kind of mm -hmm. people I'd like to bring my kids around to hang out there and the kind of people that I'd like to bring them around to meet my family. It could be a desirable location. Maybe they want to be in their hometown. It could be a, a lot of times one of the cheapest things to negotiate for a firm to give into and for an intern to negotiate is like, I want to work under her. Like she's doing amazing work. I want to work in her studio and I want to, is it possible that I can orbit her? Right. And mm -hmm. so kind of ask around, it may be a fun workplace. It may be lots of input that they're given to the firm. I think that's a huge one that the firm, the firms would come out so far ahead if they let newer employees do design work. This is a huge, hire good designers and let them design, man, and allow them to do it. Even if you don't wind up using all their work uh, because they don't know the code as well and they don't, they don't understand there's a you know, kind of fire separation reason you can't be quite that open in that particular fireworks factory. <laughs> it could be growth. The firm is committed to you getting licensed. It could be autonomy. It could be people who are going to help you do your, get your licensure. It, it could be that the firm is in a, it was in a place that was just ravaged by a hurricane. So there's just going to be lots of work. There's, there's lots of other things. I, I frankly think that this firm's design work is probably the most important thing. <laughs> and, but for most people that it's not that salary is not important. It's a the difference, the difference between a high and a low salary is probably not that they're probably working within a pretty small band when they negotiate. Yeah. So mm -hmm. there's probably a really good negotiator probably can't get that much more money than one, someone who's not a good negotiator, depending, I mean, maybe if they've graduated, are we talking summer internships? Or are we talking, um, they've graduated? I think we're mostly talking summer internships because that to me is like really upon yeah. graduation, I think you should actually get hired. Like right, that's yeah. how I believe the profession yeah. should actually work. Yeah. yeah and in that case, I would say two things that sound like they're contradictory, but they're not. One is your twenties are actually, and there's a lot of research to back this up. Your twenties are much more important for your career than most people think, because everyone knows a story about someone who goofed off in their twenties and then they caught up later on and they did great. And they, they give all the credit to the fact that they taught, you know, they were a surf instructor all the way through their twenties. And that happens all the time. But the reason it's interesting is because it's man bites dog. It's the exception. And most people who are super successful at any career, if right. you say what you do in your teens and twenties are like, oh, I was singularly focused on, on getting really good at this thing that I'm not really good at. So it's not that you shouldn't become a bartender in your 20s or join a band or join the army or anything like that. I think those are all great things. But I think all things being equal, if you don't have a you know a passion to do something else in particular, I think your 20s are actually, I mean, the research suggests that your 20s are actually a really important time to get a lot of work done mm -hmm. in your, on your career and give yourself, it's, it's like anything else that compounds. It just, it compounds. You, you start off a little better at 22 and then you're a little bit better off than you, even more better off than you would have been at 27 and your career has taken off a lot and you're 34. And so on the one hand, I think your 20s is really important. And when you do graduate, negotiating a good salary is probably really important for that same kind of compounding reason. But from a summer summer point of view, if you're making 15 bucks an hour versus 17 bucks an hour, trust me, in the end of your career, you're not going to be, damn, I definitely should have taken the job with 17 and not the better, not the better yeah. workplace for 15. Right. Like no, nobody will ever think that. So let me phrase it a little bit different. So I come to it in the question that has been raised you know, multiple times with different conversations. It's like, would you do this now if you knew, you know, back then what you know now? So I always look at it as a way of exposure. It's like the same thing was like when, would you have joined the army if you would have known that you were going to end up going to combat and things like that. And, and so I, I look at it as like summer internships are an opportunity to kind of like really understand what the profession's all about. Right. And it's trying to get his maximum exposure to like all the different facets. Asking the questions, hey, I'd like to utilize my summer internship to be a part of concept design, be a part of construction administration, be a part of all these different project teams to get a real understanding about like what I'm up against in the future of the profession. Because I've had many of in an intern that has graduated and I love taking them out onto a construction site because it's kind of the end result of all of their hard work of the design and documentation and all of that other stuff. And they're like, I never realized how much management or how much administrative work is in architecture. 
and to kind of like expose them to like all the different facets so they really understand it, really feel comfortable with it. Yeah, this is what I want to do. Yeah, because a lot of times people are like, oh man, I have seen a lot of people quit architecture because it's like, this is not what I expected. This is not what I was signing up for when I went. And I was like, but you, wait, you went like five, six years of college and you never stopped to just say, what the hell am I getting myself into? Well, they, they could have been surprised because their experience in school is typically very different than what it is right. once you graduate and get into it as a career. So I think I, I think you're right on the money here, which is you do want to be looking at these other avenues within architecture because my school focused on one thing. That one thing was design. <laughs> and design is super, super, super important. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I think that's a, a reason why we do what we do. Yeah. But also realizing that there's a lot of different ways in which that gets accomplished, and those roles are also very meaningful. And not everybody fits that designer role. Right. Like, actually, a small percentage actually do, because there's a small number of people who can actually design the number of buildings that get designed. Right. And so these other roles are extremely important. And so during internships, I do believe it is important to branch out and just experience what those other things mm -hmm. are. Maybe there's a better fit for you. Maybe there isn't, right. but now you know. And and to speak to what you were just talking about, Cormac, it's like knowing, just knowing what is out there, right. what it could be like, what it's going to be like, however you want to phrase that, is super important, I think, upon graduation when you actually are going to go get hired somewhere because then you have a better sense of where you might fit into that puzzle, at least as right. a starting point. It doesn't mean you're going to be in that track forever. And I've jumped tracks. I've jumped all over the place. And I could do different roles, but then it also shows you that you, if you want to really focus on your strengths, this is where I should be right. in the profession of architecture. Yeah. I mean, there's two different ways to really look at that. Maybe three different ways to look at that. One way to look at it is to say, okay, you're spending a lot of time doing stuff that's not design. I mean, you're spending a shocking amount of time oh, yeah, <laughs> doing yeah. stuff that yeah. relative to what's design. And and you could look at that like a, like a pilot who is saying, well, if I'm spending most of my time in the air, why am I having to spend so much of my learning on takeoff and landing? So, you know, you could say, okay, yeah, sure. We're spending a lot of time on CDs and CA, but, but the most important things we're doing are happening at SD and, and not just SD, the first two days of SD where you're making 10, 20,000 decisions an hour, right. where you're just making just decision after decision. And it's frankly, always shocking and somehow not shocking how unwilling we are to back up a little once we head down that once we start once we orient towards once we turn the turret of the tank a given direction we just you know, kind of keep going that way so that's one way to look at it and, and certainly from the point of view of the academy or, or my role in it anyway i don't really see our role as as making uh, good professionals for the first five years or even the last 10 years it's more like year five to year 20 this kind of range where you're most responsible for the for the takeoff and the landing for the most the most important parts right. so that's one way to look at it. another way to look at it like you said evan is as an architectural acoustician by trade because that's one of my professions was as an architectural acoustician it was freaking awesome to focus on my strength i'm pretty good at physics i'm not as good at music as you guys are but but i'm pretty good at physics and and i wanted to combine physics and architecture and i became an architectural acoustician and this was like a really wonderful career and it opened up so many doors so much earlier than it would have been open to me otherwise i could tell you a story about that if you guys like and then there's a third way which is that the times have changed and so one of the things that i do uh, is we have a transfer program where people can, it's actually very difficult. We'll often have 60 people trying to get in for 10 slots uh, at Virginia Tech, where if you got, if you went to Virginia Tech for French or engineering or theater, um, and you decide you want to transfer into architecture, you come and you interview. And one of the questions I hate that they always ask, I can't stand this question because it's so canned, <laughs> is they'll say, what makes you want to be an architect? And what, what drew you to us? Which is such a stupid question to me. But anyhow, they'll ask, what makes you want to be an architect? Because it, and it's stupid because the answers always seem both too deep and too shallow at the same time. Like they're, you know, they're just trying too hard. And I love when someone says, oh, I went to see this particular lecture and I just got so excited. Like to me, that's like, I want that person. But that's not usually what they say. They say, oh, I played with Legos and then I took a course in art. I took a course in high school yeah. and, then, and then I really don't like my current major. And you know, so it's, it's like, dude, you're not helping yourself. But twice now, twice, once each year, once last year, once the year before, 
when I'm interviewing these people, they said, well, I started listening to podcasts and I'd say, what podcast? And both times they said this podcast and this (laughs) podcast and, 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 and if nothing else, this podcast is an eyes wide open kind of view of the profession and how it differs from school. This is something I've listened to a lot of your episodes. This is not the first, second, third, fifth, 10th, 20th time. It's more than any of those that you guys have kind of touched on the idea that once you get into the profession, it's not quite what you think it is. Right. Mm-hmm. And in terms of the in terms of the allocation of time and in terms of the number of different number of different buckets that you kind of have to put your stuff in, it's way different than for most people than what it's like in school. And so I think that that you guys, frankly, are providing a really important service to people and kind of letting people know you guys are both simultaneously like you're like cheerleaders, but you're really realistic cheerleaders. You're like yeah. kind of <laughs> cheerleaders for the practice, but there's kind of like there's really kind of like with just just enough cynicism and kind of and kind of doubt to to give you credibility. And so I, you know, I just don't think that it's as common anymore. Okay, that's not true. I mean, when I talk to, so I also give the tours to the parents Mm -hmm. and they all think architects make a lot of money. (laughs) I don't think, that's just really funny, right? They all think architects make a lot of money and they have, they have no idea that the the kind of trajectory of the unemployment of architects. So it's not that the word has completely filtered out, but it's, it, it is moving out. It is really hard to keep a secret in 2024. Yeah. That's a really good point. I think we should probably wrap up at this point, but I do want you to tell the story about the doors that were opened as an architectural acoustician. So, hey, let's do something different here. Let's say our goodbyes. And for those people who want to keep listening and hear the story, let's just call this a little bit of after episode story time (laughs) with Michael. But because because that's I, I hope that they do. But uh, Michael, it's been a, a yeah. fantastic conversation with you today, and I think there's been so much shared in this episode that spans between licensure, studying to get licensed, internships, career advice, what firms can do. So it's not just the candidates seeking a spot at a firm for an internship or for their career, but it's also for the firms that are trying to attract the best talent, which every firm wants to attract the best talent, but they maybe don't have a plan in place to do so. Uh, Because I think there's a lot of baggage in this industry that is really hard to get over. And one of the baggage carousels is is the thinking that there there is always a line at the door of people trying to get in. And to speak to your last point about how fast information gets out, like it, it's about the perception of these firms as well. And it's w- what kind of impression are they making? What kind of work are they doing? Do people want to go work there? What kind of people do they have? Are those people talking out loud in public or, or, do we not, or is it a black box? I think that there's so many things that firms have to rethink and get and and totally ditch the the old baggage of well there's always going to be more interns knocking on the door it's like how can you actually have the best interns that turn into the best staff members that you've ever had and don't have to do it the way that you did can completely leapfrog the way that i did it in the past and take this firm somewhere i could never have imagined like that is actually possible but i don't think we think about it that way enough so there's been tons of great stuff in here. So again, thank you so much for, yeah. for taking thank the you. time to, really to do this today. All right. So if, if people want to turn this off now, turn it off. But if you want to hear a, a story that well, <laughs> I want to hear what this is about, because I got to be honest, I'm not sure what the open doors is about. It well, you said of, you, you became an architectural acoustician. Oh, and an open doors. doors. Okay. Doors. I thought you meant literally because there are there, for <laughs> I spent about seven years researching a very specific kind of concert hall called a coupled volume concert <laughs> hall that has doors in them. So I thought maybe you knew something about the door. No. Like this, physically, there are literally doors in a concert yes, hall. That uh, it's, like, it's like a room that's surrounded doors. by another room, and there are doors that open and close between them. And one of the things that I kind of discovered is the importance of only opening the doors a little bit to get the effect that people are looking for. So I thought you were specifically talking about those open doors, and I was blown away that you had read so much of my academic research that you knew about the open doors. Oh, open doors. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so... So it started when I had, I wonder if I should say the name of the firm. Screw it. I'm going to say the name of the firm. (laughs) When I graduated from architecture school, 
when I graduated from architecture school, I was looking for a job and I was looking both in architectural acoustics that I had some background in and I had interned for three years at that point in architectural acoustics. And I was also looking for jobs just in straight up architecture. And, and so I was at Raffaele Vignoli's office and they said, we want to hire you. They, I mean, they said, oh, we're, we're interested in, in, in doing it. I said, great. When would I start? And the woman said, no, it doesn't work like that. You start when we win a competition. Mm -hmm. And this is for $28,000 to live, work in New York City at the time. And I was like, okay. I said, and I understand how competitions work, but am I, is this something I'm going to have to wait? What's the over under? And how long right. I'm going to have to wait right. was my next question. Ballpark. It's basically Come on. ballpark, just so I can, like, do I need to get another job for two years while I'm waiting? Or, do, right. or should I move home? Should I start moving into, it's going to be like in three weeks? Like what's, you know, which competitions you've applied for and when they're, when the schedule is. So I kind of was like, okay, can you give me some feedback as to when that might be? And not only did she not answer me, but she seemed so annoyed that I asked, <laughs> like, how dare I, ask? how dare I ask? And, and this, this was a place where I got the impression people didn't see Vignoli very much, the, the people who are at the, the, the lower end of the totem pole. But mm -hmm. it's a, as you guys know, in this profession, it's a ratchet. It's much easier to work for Hertz and the Biron and then go work for another firm than it is to work for another firm and hope you can get a job at Hertz and the Biron. Mm -hmm. and, and definitely, at, especially at the time in the early 2000s, Vignoli was one of those firms. So I was like, oh, what should I do? Now, I had been offered a job at what was probably at the time the most respected, certainly when it comes to concert halls and opera houses and that kind of thing, one of the most respected firms in, in architectural acoustics. And it was also in New York and it was paying about double that. <laughs> and, and I was, I, and I really liked those people and I thought, okay, well, I need to tell someone something and I'm not going to turn this other thing down. They work with really cool firms. And so I went to work for this other firm called Artec. And I was in about my third week at Artec. And, and this guy named Bob came to my desk. He said, come with me. We're going downtown. We're going to go see Vignoli. I said, okay. So I, I came uh -oh. in, right? It's just, so, right, right. And of course, he didn't meet me. And so I went downtown with him. And at this point, I knew, I think I knew a lot more about architectural acoustics than they knew I knew. I think they thought, well, that's a whole nother story. But, but anyhow, I went down with him and then, and then Vignoli was, Artec was doing the architectural acoustics for the Philadelphia Performing Arts Center, what's now called the Kimmel Center. Mm -hmm. And it was already under construction. And so the questions were based on a lot of it was kind of CA stuff. So I went down there and for maybe two hours, it was me and this guy, Bob, who really knew shockingly little about, he knew a lot about theater design, but not that much about acoustics. And so it became pretty clear that I was the go-to person for acoustics. And it was just Vignoli and his right-hand person, a woman named Sandy, and their photographer. They had a photographer who was just taking pictures of them all the time. And actually, it's funny because even now, if you go and you Google any architect, you usually see their buildings. But if you Google Rafael Vignoli, you see pictures of him because there was a photographer just snapping pictures the whole time. Anyhow, so meanwhile, Vignoli is point blank asking me, peppering me with dozens of questions and writing down notes of what I'm saying. And the whole time I'm thinking, oh my gosh, if I had started to work for you at three weeks in, you wouldn't have listened to anything I said. <laughs> and I'm the and I'm the exact and I'm the exact same person. And so you kind of fast forward. So maybe you were talking about Cormac. You were talking about being next to the, your firm, being next to the kind of entry desk. Mm -hmm. I was not far from the receptionist, and because the people in Artec didn't know that much about architecture or architects. So the woman at the front desk, kind of the, end, the person called, again, I was only there a few months and she says, there's someone named Helmut Jan on the phone. Anyone want to talk to him? I'm like, yeah, sure. I'll talk to him. I'm like, she runs out of school. So I, t I pick up the phone and I talk to him and, and he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about going for this, this competition in China. And it's Helmut himself. And he's like, wow. what do you think? Would you want to work with me? And I'm like, sure. I mean, I didn't know. I didn't have any authority to say yes. <laughs> but nobody, I, I, we didn't sign a contract. I probably was never even paid for this. I, I don't know. I said, sure, I, I can work with you on that. And for the next month, maybe three, four times a week, I was on the phone with Helmut Jan. He was sending drawings and I was marking him up and sending him back. Just me and him. There was no one else on the phone. Amazing. And these are opportunities that I just, because I was an acoustician and architects think acoustics is magic, which it's not. But architects <laughs> think that there's no way that I as an architect could understand this stuff when you totally could. There's no way I could understand it. So this acoustic, this person who, this sorcerer who's trained in acoustics must know everything. And the same thing happened when I came to interview. So I was 27 when I got the job at Virginia Tech as a tenure track person. And that was, as far as I know, then or since then, I've, I, I've, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure there have been younger people, but I've never seen them. 
and here or anywhere else. And, and it was not because I was so amazing. It was because I had um, what economists call the importance of being unimportant. If you're the only person who can do something that no one else can do, it completely changes everything. Okay. So I came here for a lecture and the person who I gave as my reference told me later that the architecture faculty here at Virginia Tech called him up and said, Erwin said this, 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 and this. Are those true? And he said, yes, they're true. And they were like, okay. At least. And so they offered me the job on the spot. And, and I had, I said, well, hold on. I have other interviews and I had other interviews only because I was an acoustician and these other interviews led to other job offers and tech was able to match these job offers in ways that nobody could have, I wouldn't have gotten a lab if, if I was a, a generalist uh, design studio, which mm -hmm. I teach design studio. It's my favorite thing to teach. But if I was in a design studio only teacher and I said, I need tens of thousands of dollars for a lab to, to do my research. They'd give me the finger. I can't give it to you and the other 50 people who do what you right. do. Like, I can't give everyone 40. But if you're the only acoustician and acoustics is magic, and then you get in that. And, and on and on and on and on. I mean, on and on and on and on. So, yeah, I would say in any profession, it is a specialized, you know, it's a it's a grad school world, frankly. It's a specialization world. I think if you if you had bladder cancer, you would not go to your family physician for that. You would go to the urological oncologist for that, right? And so this idea that the idea, this bullshit idea of the noble generalist, you got me going now. <laughs> this bullshit idea of this bullshit idea of the noble generalist who is that somehow it's more noble to not be specialized is crazy to me. And somehow if you specialize too much, you could if you're the acoustician, and this goes back to being the rapper that, that kind of has to prove themselves. If you're the acoustician, there's no way you could be a good designer. If you're the designer there's no way you could be an acoustician which of course is crazy but both sides both sides of that divide want to believe that you could never do the other one because maybe right. they can't do the other one and to the idea that you could kind of specialize and have all the financial and career opportunity and just a chance to really move the needle in a small profession where there's no, where there's not that many people who do it and you kind of get to know everyone and you can talk to you can you have these books on architectural acoustics on your shelf and you can go to an acoustics conference and you can meet all the people who wrote those books and it's amazing yeah. it's absolutely amazing so good story you came on my other podcast to talk about expertise and generalism and we had a big conversation about that and i think uh, you you're, you're starting to convince me yeah, I'm that, convinced there's, <laughs> that, there's, that there's a place for that there's a place for specialization. And, well, I I know there's a place for it, but <laughs> and, and honestly, we we've, we've been having this conversation like me and a bunch of friends at work, we've been having this conversation about generalist versus specialist and the importance of both and one can guide kind of like overall vision of things, but then find the right people to pull in for the right tasks to do the right thing to make it the right project, right? Um yeah. There was a whole well, and lot I of see it I, in terms of in terms of in terms of aptitude. You know, these aren't people who necessarily pursue specialization, but in terms of aptitude, because I teach technical courses and studio courses, I can tell you that the distribution is almost equal. So, if you could picture a one of those like two by two grids, mm -hmm. and you have you know strong at studio, weak at strong at design, weak in design, and you have strong at technical and weak at technical. The students I've taught, so I've now taught 2,000 students plus, and I've taught 20 years of studios and all kinds of technical courses. And I can tell you that it is evenly distributed between those four mm -hmm. boxes. In mm -hmm. other words, mm -hmm. a quarter of them are bad at both, but they keep their mouth shut. A quarter of them are good at both, are strong at both, and half of them are good at one and good at the other. So of the ones who speak, those seem to be the ones who speak and they say you have to be one or the other, but they're not representing, they, they're representing two of the four boxes, right. but they're, people group them together as one or the other, even though they're two different things, right? I just don't believe that, that it really works out that way, that you have to be good. And I think right. it's quite common to be strong at one or the other, but I don't think it's required. No. No. Awesome. I love that you told that story. Yeah, that Thank was you. great. <laughs>